So my name is Rafe First. I'm the founder, the founder and chief investment officer of a crypto company. And I like to think of the crypto company as the gateway for all the people who are not in this room, who are interested in getting financial exposure, investment exposure to this new exciting asset class, but don't have the technical uh, jobs from the, from the time or the two risk averse. So we invest broadly in this space in tokens, technology, and teams, and uh, and then we have a public stock, and people can buy our public stock. So we're like the Berkshire Hathaway of the space. And for that reason, I'm really excited that we bought this panel. We have some expert investors in, in fintech and blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I think I'm going to get some really good hot tips out of this. So. Um, why don't we go with a round, start with just a round, a couple sentence introduction just like I did for myself, and then we're going to jump right into hot topics. Great. Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, I'm Scott Robinson. I'm the founder and VP of Pumpkin Play FinTech. I've led about 36 investments in the past two years. Uh, we actually saw a couple of our portfolio companies back to the MT on stage prior, and you'll hear from other folks later today. Um, we're known for accelerating startups uh, in the Valley, and we also uh, have about 22 locations around the world. Um, our fund is a family office, we've been investing since the late 90s, so with that we've invested in companies like PayPal, Lemon Club, Dropbox, and about 651. Um, so I lead the FinTech Initiative, which means uh, we engage with roughly 35, 40 large financial institutions around the world, but this was born out of a Bitcoin meetup by around that Roger Mayer passed to me in the Valley. Um, we're very, very bullish on that space, and so we kind of straddle the line between uh, the corporate facing and kind of traditional or legacy fintech solutions of some of the emerging stuff we're watching and watching. My name is Elise Kaleen. My background is in traditional venture capital and here in Los Angeles, working with two of the larger PC funds with a particular focus on enterprise tech and infrastructure tech which acted as a natural gateway or lead-in to my investment work in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space, which began in about 2013. Um, I was an early investor in companies like Blockstream and Blockchain.info, um, and now today, in 2016, I started my own practice, which is split between advisory work with other investors that are entering this space or others for the first time, and then direct venture capital investing as well. Hey, I'm uh, Dominic Phillips. I'm uh, president of Streamlabs, which is a Silicon Valley based incubator, investor, and studio in open protocols, and also chief scientist at Divinity Stifton, which is developing. Infinitely scalable uh, blockchain computer network, in which uh, we hope can act as a kind of centralized cloud and introduce a whole mass of high cost. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Rodolfo Gonzalez. I'm a partner at Foundation Capital. We're a 23 year old venture firm in the building and management. Uh, pretty active in the group of investors in Lending Club, Monday, and uh, many more. Financial services firms. Um, and uh, when it comes to blockchain, we started investing probably three years ago in into countries. So uh, we we're fortunate to be uh, investors into Block Cypher, uh, Rave, and uh, ETH uh, in the space. Uh, but you know, uh, I feel like over the past year, there's so much activity and a lot of stuff has changed. So even when I look at my peers, uh, I thought that I had a little bit more knowledge about the space than, than they did, and now I feel like I'm totally way behind on what has happened because the last six months have been just like too many activities. So, very excited to chat more about how we're seeing the world these days. Yeah, so true. Okay, so uh, by a show of hands, who here has uh, ever bought Bitcoin? Alright, now keep your hands up. Who here has bought uh, an altcoin that is not on Coinbase? Okay. Who has invested in a, in a token sale or an ICO? Okay. And who is doing an ICO or contemplating doing an ICO? Okay, cool. Good, helpful to know. Um, 
we're going to jump right in uh, to the to the hottest topic, which is the ICO, which I'm going to I'm going to refer to from now on as a token sale. Um, I think there's a lot of us in the industry who find a problem that that, that, that is called an initial coin offering um, because we many of us don't believe that these are securities. Um, but uh, we can call it token sale, crowd sale. In the second quarter of this year, a surprising statistic, uh, token sales have eclipsed or eclipsed all of venture capital for the quarter in terms of how much money entrepreneurs have raised around the world. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but that happened really quickly. Um, so the, the question is, uh, is this method of, of finance and investing, is it going to eclipse, is it going to take over for venture capital and crowdfunding? Um, and then, you know, what are the risks and benefits that you see? We just uh, take turns and we want to jump into the breach there. Sure, I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, I think to, to the venture capitalists, this represents a very unique level of liquidity that is yet to really be seen. So, from a risk position at uh, boost investment. It's a really interesting way for you to kind of look a little bit deeper or pay a little bit more risk as it relates to your investment. And so, um, the implications for whether it will cannibalize general venture capital I think is, is not particularly relevant in the sense that the value of wealth having to be seen or maybe the walk of life of portfolio or Rolodex are very valuable um, offerings to, to a startup. Whereas in the crowd sale, um, or the token sale in this case, I, I think, you know, one of the significant value propositions is, is to the, the actual consumer taking the risk. And, and we also have the Oculus and what that may have translated to as far as value for that, that initial funding of the first project that you know, raised maybe a million or so. Um, and so the point being is, uh, while the liquidity is helpful to the VC, it also, I think, at the same time, opens doors for a lot more innovation, generally speaking. And we were just talking to Constantine, and Lisa, and I think mean, this is a very good point you made um, um, from Buckley. And, uh, often the capital barrier for particularly things like hardware or a long tail investment requiring R&D posts is, is uh, as you might imagine, and coming from your walk of life to an entrepreneur, that's a lot of time to raise money. And so um, this may mean a very interesting circumvention, a very quicker process for often a far more complex uh, capital round and the products uh, that can be invested as part of an asset like that. So uh, I don't think we'll capitalize venture capital, but I do think it's a very interesting offering to the VC in the sense that yeah, now they can perhaps have 20x 20, 20 uh, investment offering, and then you know, with that tail, maybe see a little bit more return in the close first small side. So that's a very interesting thing. Yeah, you make a great point. For me, what resonates as an investor uh, and venture and an angel investor for many years is, is how powerful and important liquidity is. Uh, and so that, that's really resonant. You may ask. But I think venture capital is an asset class is just so small that in a way it's very developed, right? Like we, we put together, I mean, removing other international money, corporate money that is going into space, like net, net, like what you would call venture capital is like 30 to 40 billion dollars uh, a year, right? And, you know, that's, it's tiny when you compare it to private equity, bond markets, like just, you know, any of the asset classes next to it are just orders of magnitude. So why is venture capital relevant? And you can think about it as a product, right? And the product includes the money, uh, it, it includes the governance on the company side, and it includes the uh, advice, right? Like the, the, uh, the being a um, fellow in travel with the entrepreneur in the company building right? Um, so when you look at venture as a gatekeeper to what ideas merit funding which one is not. Uh, that is one part of the, of, the, of the layer that goes into buying that product of, of venture capital, right? So I guess the way that I see it is you're, you're seeing the idiosyncrasies of venture investors being challenged by a crowd, and, and a crowd that is very interesting in the sense that it's very technical. It's, um, it's looking for these types of products, right? So there's, there's a lot of signal that comes into this. Um, what 
is probably not going to come out of out of this uh, token sales or this crowd sales. Are the other pieces of the package, right? Like in terms of governance, uh, and in terms of helping uh, with a lot of the institutional knowledge and experience into what what goes into building a successful company. And and so I think okay, again bringing bringing it back to how relevant is venture probably not that uh, relevant in the grand scheme of things, uh, but it's just a high leverage type of capital that. that if you tra trace back uh, the number of public companies today, um, probably 30-40% of the, of the publicly traded companies in the U.S. today have some sort of cultural backing. Uh, right? So it's like just a, a, a massive engine of uh, growth and, and, and company creation. So I don't, I don't think it's going to plant that um, those pieces of the, of the value proposition because there's actually not that many good investors that are good board members that are good company builders out there, right? And there's actually very few. When you look at seed stage companies, right, like there are hundreds, probably thousands of venture-backed companies that have raised money on a convertible note, that have no board, that have wasted a ton of money, and their survival rates are actually way lower, right? So when you look at what's going to happen to a lot of these companies, that have no governance and they have really no experience in company building, it's going to be even worse than the way you see with a lot of these companies that haven't been able to graduate into the, the traditional uh, milestones of what a series A company would require for a venture investor to come on board and, and sign up for a seven year journey to trying to set up all the companies. Great, great answer. There's a lot of, a lot of nuance and detail there. Hopefully, we can circle back and, uh, and dig in on some of that. But, uh, I wanted to jump in to say that I could argue probably either side of the ICO case. Um, to provide a bit of history on the space, I think token sales started in 2014 and 15, and Scott and I actually were involved in traditional venture diligence on um, two of the first three token sales um, and crowd sales, and a speaker actually from our last panel. Craig Sellers was an engineer on, one of the, on the first ICO, or token sale. I think that what we saw, what we, so what those companies did really well was that in addition to bringing on crowdfunding capital through the, through the, the community itself, they also brought on some form of traditional venture capital to complement that. And then separate from both of those things, they formed advisory boards that were robust enough to support the company in terms of the traditional venture value set for founders. So what that means is introductions, helping to think through strategy, helping companies to evaluate their, their core financial statements, for instance. So these companies all, all did that. And companies today that are thinking smartly and sharply about how to do a token sale, I think, do this. I wanted to point out one thing that I haven't heard other panelists mention yet that I think is, is profoundly important in what's happening in the ICO space, which is that founders that traditionally would have more difficulty in accessing capital they need to build their businesses now can do that. And so I think there's certain buckets of folks that we hear about having difficulty raising venture capital. And folks that are um, deeply technical and, and uh, infrastructure or lower level engineers um, have, have historically tended to have a harder time at explaining the value proposition and the trajectory of their company to the, the Silicon Valley suits, right? Or the Silicon Valley khaki pants. Um, and so I think that the wisdom of the crowd and the ability to gather capital from the crowd is really important for these types of folks, and we're, we're seeing that, and I'm most excited about that. On the flip side, something that was uh, referenced a, a bit by one of the panelists is that venture capital is it's a, a, a small portion of the pie in terms of the equity that exists um, in the financial systems. But what's interesting is that the value that's that's created by companies is mostly captured now today in the private markets rather than in the public markets. So by the time the company goes to IPO and you have access to invest in the stock, the value that that company has created it has already kind of been captured by VC investors and their LPs. And so I, this is why I'm also excited about crowdfunding is that 
we all now have access to participate in the value created in early technologies and companies because we can do that at the private, private stages of their development. Yeah, regarding uh, venture capital and uh, ICOs, just two uh, points. One is that um, the big VCs in the valley and changing their own peer agreements so they can uh, invest directly into tokens. Many venture capitalists are prevented from buying tokens by their peer agreements, but a lot of them now are working on those own peer agreements so they can buy tokens. Um, big VCs are uh, also investing into token benchmarks like Polychain Capital. So, I think that's a sign of the times that you know, the venture capital community is looking to buy tokens. Um, the other point is that, you know, from the perspective of an entrepreneur, traditional venture capital um, setup has given you some sort of binary outcome. You know, if you decide to raise a round, and the round's going to be X, and you do a kind of roadshow, and you hope at the end of it you get some term sheets. Term sheets, but, you know, in many cases, people don't get term sheets. Or, Spend months and months kind of to get money. But the nice thing uh, with ICOs by comparison is that you get uh, a sort of kind of linear outcome. Like rather than being binary, you might want to raise five million dollars, but you might okay, you want to get five million dollars and you want money three million dollars and that would be not plans to develop your proposition. So um, you know I think entrepreneurs will flock to the ICO system for that reason. Because it gives them just in the same way that Bitcoin miners, you know, um, work through pools because, you know, those living in a constant stream of income, entrepreneurs will want to do ICOs because it's a given that it's finally a better success outcome. Maybe they do better than they have, maybe they do it worse, maybe they do it worse, at least they do something, right? And they can progress. I think that's one of the key things that's going to drive us forward even faster. That's maybe uh, you guys covered so much ground, um, and there's such a great wealth of information here. I, I hope you can stick around and answer questions for those who are uh, perhaps looking to do their own token sale. Um, but I want to switch gears now and talk about it from the investor's standpoint. Um, Dominic, starting with you, what do you look for in uh, you know in, in a new uh, potential token token offering? You know, if you, if you really have a thousand X return, you have to look at the blood levels of the system. So, um, you know, I'm old enough to have gone through Joel Cobb, and you know, back then I remember the first guys to get rich were the ones who had started up by ISPs, right? Because it was mass consolidation. You know, going back in time to the California gold rush, the people who got richest were going to sell in shovels, right? So, you know, Especially initially, the value is going to be in the platforms. So the lower you go in the stack, the greater the chance of seeing a return. And to some degree, we've seen that you know, the appetite for potatoes and the else to so on to fit to yourself. Sure. Kind of fundraiser soon. But um, so I think that's probably the most important thing. If you can choose a platform that wins out and has lots of people. Talk really magnify your return. Elise? Can you? I, I, I lost the question. So, yeah, yes. so uh, do you look at uh, if you're investing in a, in a token, either pre sale or, or a crowd sale, do you look at that uh, differently or the same, or how, how, how would you characterize it? Versus like an angel investment or a, a C or Series A investment in venture capital. So in the in my prior answer, I said that I began with the fact that Scott and I separately had looked at some of the first uh, token sales that were offered as venture investors. So the offer was made to me um, as a member of a, a traditional venture fund. Would you like to buy a, a chunk of tokens in this sale? Um, the way that we, so I, I, let me speak only to specifically what's different about investing in a token, I think, than doing true venture invested investment where you diligence a company and understand the market value of the company given where it's at in the stack and, um, and the competitive ecosystem. 
In the token ecosystem, I think what's really important is how the token impacts the function of the company, how it's used in operations, or it's, it's dependent upon for proper function of the company. And now what we see in token sales, or companies offering tokens, is that sometimes the token um, can take an intrinsic value because it is necessary for the system to function. Um, and then other times, unfortunately, you don't. And so in, in evaluating a token sale, I think what's important is to assume that the token needs to have an intrinsic value that almost can be a discovered value. If you understand, um, if you understand the eventual uh, market cap potential of your company. So, Rodolfo, um, in venture capital and angel investing, it, it's it's sort of a given that the most important factor is the team, especially at the early stages. Um, and and in a lot of these new token initiatives, uh, there's there's not a company per se. Invest in the team is distributed and amorphous, and uh, it changes very rapidly. And there's nothing necessarily holding them together after token sales. So, uh, how do you think about that as an investor? And what other factors are, are important besides the team? I, I think you sort of have to think um, on what is your advantage. Right, as an investor, like what is your edge? Why are you showing up? Um, when I look at the types of companies that I'm as a firm and as foundation to be investing, a lot of it is related to the network that the founders of the firm and the, every single investor that has come across to the firm um, has built over a couple of decades, right? And so we've been fortunate to invest in over 200 companies. Um, Bunch of ideas, like lots of value created, right? And so we have access to a pretty strong network of entrepreneurs. And so there's that level of trust, right? And so when, when, I, when I look at what types of companies would I invest in, a lot of the reputation of the entrepreneurs is, is pretty broad. Right? And so, for instance, great, we invested in probably over a year and a half ago, even before they had thought of the ICO as a, as a potential fund. Um, and it's on the basis that, that the founder was the founder of JavaScript <laughs> and, and uh, that has used among the best tech in the town, period. Like, it's just not even uh, a question, right? Um, now, there's another set of companies that are ICO, you know, and those are companies that have been around for a while and have a user base, and they're adding uh, some token to the existing uh, model, right? And often you're going to see all of these companies that have interesting assets, interesting products, that have had a really hard time monetizing these, uh, these products, right? So whether it's Kick, um, which we're also um, uh, big shareholders of, that, you know, like the, the um, messaging, um, messaging apps, um, they've had a, a hard time monetizing in the, in the US, right? And so um, this is an opportunity for them to turn that asset into the next generation of value and, and property, right? So when I talk to fellow investors, some people have the, the preference for investing in the lower layers of the stack because you can't just create a whole version of the decentralized internet and all of this uh, awesome network. Other people would argue that, well, there is some value in the product and there's precedent of this team having a track record of creating a product to market and having a user base. And then can the token enhance this product and create even more value than that? Some people would say, no, because it's a centralized entity, so that doesn't work. work. And in some other cases, people would say, like, that actually makes sense. Like, that's, that's pretty reasonable. And, and you're going to see a number of companies that, that would not have an easy time monetizing uh, trying to you know, take, take a shot at, at creating a token and see if that, if that sticks. Um, personally, I'm a little bit concerned with some of the claims that the the way that people are creating the, the, the token design, the incentive mechanisms, is like they know a priori what's going to work and how the world is going to work. At least what I've seen in terms of how a company goes from an idea to eventually this awesome notion of finding product market fit. 
is that actually you just don't know. You build a lot of stuff, and some stuff works, some stuff you actually have to revisit a lot of your assumptions, right? And so when you look at the way that a lot of the tokens are designed, it's like people have passed forward to a logical conclusion that might or may not be there. And history of entrepreneurship would show that that's ah, probably going to be different. Like maybe you'll, you'll get there, but it's going to it's not going to be a linear path, it's going to be two steps forward, you know, one, one step back, and, and, and back and forth. And so that is kind of like one of the one of the big questions that I have when I look at uh, some of the white papers that uh, you have. Yeah, if we have time later, maybe we can dig into what, what can be done about that in terms of programming the governance of the token so that it's not so sort of fixed. But uh, I want to talk about uh, ideas, uh, Scott, because as entrepreneurs and as investors, even though we know that the team is where the action is, typically we get seduced by the ideas. And what I'm uh, intrigued by is, is it, is it, is it the case that, or, uh, or is it possible that with this new way of uh, building an entrepreneurial venture or a, or a network or, a, or an application, a distributed application, is it, Possible uh, that the value of the idea or the good idea is increased, or is it is it still the case that you really just have to uh, have to develop? Well, I want to come on the path, so I'll try to answer that. But I think you know to the point where we see, I mean, from public place perspective, we're very active, early stage investors, so we have a very significant risk appetite. We do 150 to 200 investments per year, and generally, there's a joke that runs around the office, plug and pray, in the sense that. You know, these are the mechanics that need to be a successful angel investor. You have to take a lot of risk. And so, maybe one of five of those investments on the annualized basis for six to seven years is where you get the return. Uh, so, at it from a token perspective, it's a very exciting length of reach now. Um, if you basically scale that mentality across every single opportunity, I mean, if you do this correctly, it's a very kind of easy, you know, nice flexible curve drop for the return. Um, we still are sitting on the very front of this bell curve of understanding implications from many different aspects. So, for example, uh, we have a couple of portfolio companies that now have a mix, both of a you know, traditional uh, structuring for investment, and then you know, what would be whether or not it's defined as of yet, in order to invest in another event, which is basically in the shape of conversion. And so, because of that, we, we're going to find a number of these hybrid like, companies that kind of have gone through the hump of. And building up the traditional infrastructure and status and, and, and company um, structure, and now uh, carrying with them something that they could argue is income or revenue versus, say, uh, what others might consider as security. So that's a big question for us. Um, but getting back to the question of how we're looking at, at these tokens, uh, I think Elise's point is very, very relevant. We've heard uh, so many startups say we're considering an ICO. And then we, you know, venture further to the web and say, okay, what's the business model in addition to how you're going to play this out? And then the question is, well, why are you, you know, why do you care? You're going to have a three-inch return on, you know, so on 10 days, two weeks, or whatever it might be. So there, there's a lot of, I think, hindsight that has yet to really been passed for us to understand the implication of, is this a security or not? What happens when a large round comes about? And then perhaps the most important is the reconciliation of a failed company that's you know, had a lot of money brought in, the rights of some sort of reconciliation offering to, in this case, something like a notebook or, or an equity position. So, lots of risk there, lots of upside there, but because it's become so liquid, it's very, it's very interesting in the sense that um, you can take a lot more risk. So, if you don't know the entrepreneur very well, our tradition has always been let's put them in our cohort facility or let's run them through some of our partners and glean signal from industry as, as in addition to our working process. And so, um, this is a very exciting time, but I think we can expect some of what we've seen when Bitcoin is first coming about. There's going to be guidance that's in place. There'll probably a couple of heads that will roll because of this. Um, and as it may reconcile 33, 34 security. Okay, so you actually uh, bring up a natural transition. I want to talk about geography. Um, I noticed that uh, we have, uh, at least you have experience in Singapore, or is your current company uh, based in Singapore? And, uh, uh, Dominic, you're I'm not... looking for it. I, so I'm based in California. Okay. Um, but Scott and I also, I run a big bulk traveling work a lot in Singapore where the government's pushing to create a regulatory arbitrage opportunity for fintech and blockchain companies. Yeah, so uh, thanks for correcting. Singapore and Switzerland seem to be the, the two places that are really leading the charge in terms of 
dynamic regulations and attracting a lot of people have already left the United States, for instance, and set up shop in, in, in Zug, I guess it is. Uh, Zug. Zug. Is, is, it the, is that the Crypto Valley? Crypto Valley, yeah. So, um, the model is inspired by um, the Ethereum uh, fundraiser where they created a network of um, Ethereum Zug, which is called Stiftum. It's a not for profit network that um, basically is trying to support the Ethereum Zug body for systems and you know the system has a notorial D that specifies um, how to operate in the rules and also attach bylaws. And the original model which I think was still to involve in it was that um, and this is essentially what Divinity has, uh, people can make donations to the system and the system uh, records receipts Building these main donations and uses the money that's being donated to develop the technology. And when it judges that the technology is sufficiently advanced to launch the network, it makes a recommendation that the network is launched with a genesis state, an initial state, where the initial allocations of tokens on that network reflect the donations that have been made. And, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting setup and it means that, you know, the, the foundation itself, I know you guys are the networks, but the foundation itself um, is simply dispersing money by ID, the hiring engineers, and so on. Um, and interestingly, it can actually issue tokens itself. Because you're talking about, you know, a, a blockchain computer network, for example, um, that, that depends upon miners, right? But in fact, it's the miners who run the client software and configure the initial genesis state and bring the recommendations uh, into being. So the foundation is only capable of collecting money, dispersing it on to develop the technology, and then when, when it judges the technology is ready, issue a recommendation of what the initial state of the network should be. Um, and that model, you know, just like Ethereum, Infinity uses that model. We've seen some evolutions of that model. Um, which uh, firstly tend to uh, reserve a large proportion of the tokens created in Genesis for the founders and investors. So that's a big change. And with Ethereum, uh, only 80% of the tokens were reserved for the foundation to down and for the developers. You know, some of the key guys um, in the Ethereum project only got about a single percent, not very much. Whereas we're seeing new projects coming out where you know, huge slices, so 30% of tokens are reserved for founders. Um, if you look at the Tezos project, um, they set up the well, they, they set up their foundation too, which is not for profit. Uh, supposedly it's a new kind of thing, didn't have a commercial dimension to it. Yet when they set up the foundation, they also created a for profit company that's called Mount Merger Solutions. And the foundation had a contract with the for profit company that guaranteed that they would receive a minimally an 8.5% percentage of all money raised. That's a minimum, by the way. It's on something that couldn't earn out there. And also 10% of the tokens. So, um, yeah, they raised 2 I don't know, it's like 20 million plus, right? Something like that. It's 20 million cash, right? For the men's raised is going directly from the foundation. Into the cell and you know, the controls of that company. And so that's a, an interesting new uh, very different model that you can create the foundation and you can have an associated uh, for profit company which, is, which has a contractual relationship with the not for profit foundation. And the not for profit foundation pays, owes money to the for profit company and the founders can kind of walk away with tens of millions of dollars. After the ICO. Um, other models we've seen, EOS, I don't really have really attention to EOS, but I'm aware that I don't think it's a non profit, I think it's a for profit company that came in And in this case, people who donate to the EOS project are actually, I think, making payments to the for profit company, um, which puts it as revenue. And I understand. Um, the company commits in terms of payments 
major to develop the blockchain technology and then roll out the stiff tips of the definitive agreement that recommended the initial genesis of my initial uh, token allocations are derived from the payments map. But that's a big change, of course, because a for profit company that puts payments and revenues in what is the guarantee of that? You know, it's got, I think, to raise a billion dollars. What's the guarantee that that billion dollars will be directed to the development of the technology and uh, support the app? So, we're seeing the models used to evolve quickly. They tend to be evolving in the direction of giving founders manual tokens and access to the cash rates. I think the question for me is, you know, the auction still works, and, you know, traditionally in the startup world, in fact, founders do get very good shares of companies, but look at Google, and the founders actually hold control of the company through the first stock, and I think they have like 35% or something like that. So, you know, I mean, maybe it's going to work, maybe it's all better, and, and the new model where founders hold a much larger share of the tokens and receive large cash benefits will prove to be a good one. But certainly what's happening at the moment is the industry is evolving very fast and really from this theory of definitive world rapidly towards another one where you know founders are taking huge chunks of capital raise and as well as huge allocations. I think only time will tell which model works best. Yeah, so one of the salient things that you uh, you touched on is this idea of jurisdictional arbitrage. Uh, people gaining the various systems and lack of consistency between regulation. Um, and I guess it's uh, it's an argument for if there's not uh, good responsible regulation here in the U.S., uh, it, it's not going to be a safe environment for anybody. Um, it'll just push people to the, the jurisdiction that you most lax. Um, so, just uh, to be the point of my thinking, the Swiss, I think it was the, uh, some of the companies in crypto are in the house of prices. So, the Swiss regulatory framework is pretty tight. And, you know, if you have a stiff term, and it turns out that a lot of prime funds are received in accordance with the notorial deed, right, the Swiss federal supervisory body for stiff terms. Potentially freeze your stick for many months while it comes investigation and even take control of it. So, uh, you know, I think there's probably quite a few stick in crypto value that um, may have moved away from the big data. It's just a way of hiding from, you know, uh, the frameworks and things like that. Well, well um, I want to make sure that there's, there's time for questions, but I'm also really curious. Uh, I know that the audience is probably curious. We'll, we'll say Can I quickly say that one? Yeah. Thing. When you look at the evolution of some of these models and, and the permissiveness that founders are giving themselves into getting access to liquidity before even creating anything uh, of value, that to me is, is a, it's a red flag. It's a, it's a big, big uh, question mark. If you were to map the parallels of kind of like, okay, if, if you have received venture capital funding as a, as, a, as a founder, right, then you cannot just go and, and sell your shares on a secondary sale right away, right? Like that doesn't work. There's the governance part that we were comparing to, and it's just so that you're acting on it. it in theory, you assume that people will act on the best uh, interest of the shareholders. In reality, the reason why you have governance is because there's so many cases where people have kind of like touched the edge and crushed uh, across the edge and have not acted in the best interest of the shareholders of that company, right? And so a lot of what is happening now is kind of very nicely rationalizing not acting on the best interest of the, of the shareholders and of some of these uh, entities, right? And the question is like, well, okay. You're not actually getting shares in, in the companies, right? Um, you're buying tokens, and so that's that's a little bit of the question of like, well, are at some point are we poisoning the well because they're going to be bad actors, right? And, and we're already starting to see some of that come across, and that to me is a little bit uh, concerning because as much as one can believe that the Swiss regulatory system is going to be uh, on top of this stuff. I mean, it's, it's essentially the non-profit uh, regulatory body of a Swiss candidate. 
I mean, even, even the SEC struggles to keep up with some of the stuff. My personal confidence in their ability to actually stay on top of a lot of this community. Eh, I don't know. It's a question. Okay, before we move on to audience questions, I'd I probably ask are there, are there any burning uh, questions or issues that you wish that we'd gotten to? I'll we'll just kind of go around with Mark and just make sure that. I'm not just happy that you put in a new respect statement to finish it, but I do think there's a danger of what is important. And, you know, there are many lights that will happen. And, you know, to finish this book, the biggest project you ever had. It's got a rock star team, you know, to my hand in place. Basically, Wait, which one? To finish it. So, you know, if you want to see the biggest team of crypto, then we talk to them about the science and the professors and how you spend it. And rather than figures that you can see, just go to the page of your network and say, you're a good team, essentially, right? And you'll see a much bigger team and a much more competent team in the project. But, you know, we don't, for example, we have tokens to journalists, right? We don't lose any parts. And as a consequence of this, there's never been a single article in the crypto press about the first right? And so, you know, I think people are going to be very careful about the way things have evolved, you know. Uh, in some ways, it's similar to a kind of penny stock um, framework where, you know, it's a kind of echo chamber, magic circles, and rises, and reference each other, and create social proof. And ultimately, the reason for this is that people want to collect money on ICOs. If you look at the teams behind a lot of these operations, sometimes they don't even exist, or they're referencing people who work in some company, they're not working. Crypto project at all. So if you look at the Crypto team, you know, we've got offices in uh, Switzerland and Alberta, uh, and those people actually work full time and finish it, right? A lot of these, um, I won't name names, but a lot of these um, big platform guys, they have team members that don't even work on the project, right? they just pull them from somewhere else. Something you mentioned with respect to another serial entrepreneur as well as a kind of long time geek with interesting algorithms, but um, you know, so I'm very familiar with the kind of uh, investment process. And you know, generally, when you raise money from a company, you know, you certainly invest like a series of deals on something, then gets taken money out. Um, if you have pre existing shares, that's the very nature of that's best, you know, you stand with your investment. And that's not what's happening in the models. So, uh, you know, one of the things we're doing with the diversity is we're making sure that the token centers best, right, over a number of years. And the reason we've done that is look at the Ethereum project, <clears throat> you know, within a year and a half, we've been launching a lot of the engineers and the computers got rich. And you know, it's interesting, you know, closing down, the world's having a good time, and being pretty lazy. In fact, some of the key. So, Dominic, Stop it there so we can uh, we can open up the questions. You guys have anything you wanted to just say before we open it up? I think I just need to get this out there. So it took four years to get 1.3 billion in funding for most of the blockchain space, and it took less than two months to match that. And so when you map all financial technology and capital funders in the first quarter of this year, 3.4 billion is deployed. This is a big deal. And so we're all fooling ourselves. We don't think the SEC is paying attention. You can bet your ass they're going to come after somebody. So if you're doing a token sale, make sure you work with qualified attorneys that understand this market. And if you don't, just know that you can put a lot of lot. Because this is not just, hey, I went to Portland and I'm going to roll out with me. This is dealing with value. And there's a reason why the securities fraud is actually put in place and that's to protect the investor and protect the people that believe you're going to take some of that money and put it into some sort of business solution. So it's a fantastic big space and it's really exciting because it solves real problems, it solves the liquidity problems, and it gives really a a nice kind of runway for a lot of startups to get access to this where they never would have been able to, but I think you need to be very careful this time. So uh, we're watching Eyes Wide by a new era, at least. Um, I, I think that's smart. I like what Scott said. I think that for folks on the other side looking to invest potentially in token sales to make sure that you discern between marketing messages, even those, uh, you know, that present it to appear as though it's it's just provision of information and make sure you do your own research on the token and the value, uh, the intrinsic value that that token will have within the company that it, it belongs to. And to, 
to pay less attention to marketing messages, regardless of how they're presented. Just curious if any of you have an opinion on asset math tokens, whether it be gold, water rights, real estate, what have you. So we may see a lot of these pop up at Gold in particular, but it's Jean from uh, some of the solutions he's working on in Kenya. Um, there's another one called Love Gold in Singapore. Um, so, very interesting space. Uh, it's perhaps a less risky investment. You have some sort of actual asset that's physical, also making to the market forces. But as we've seen, there are elements of, of Bitcoin cannibalizing or potentially cannibalizing the function and features of gold as a reserve. Um, you know, it'll, it'll be much more interesting as we watch companies like Factum and, and the you know, products and the assets that go through the property become some sort of relevant asset on books later. Um, in which case, there's a lot more doors that open after having the problems of a particular asset. So, yeah, we're, we're looking at that very closely. Um, perhaps a little bit on the left, Miss Christian, I would expect. There's a few questions right over here. Uh, I heard you talk about uh, hybrid approaches where someone maybe is raised uh, traditionally up first and perhaps considering an ICO. I'm just wondering uh, if any of you have come across the valuation question, if you have option holders and shareholders and you actually got to get a valuation happening and, and what's happening in that, in that area. And then one other thing is, is this putting pressure on valuations and amounts of money in the traditional raising area? Uh, so I'm dealing with both of that right now. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh, you know, we, we look at the intent of what this is as it relates to whether it's a Series A, B, or Don, and as it might may relate to my rights on the formal note or other legal instruments. So, yes, that's a question mark. There's no legal precedent. Um, you don't want to ostracize your founder, you always want to be founder friendly, enable them to be as most successful as possible. In this case, you also want to protect your interest in the company. So, um, it's a question mark for us. We're trailblazing at that moment and uh, to that end. Those that are in you know, the space that are looking at it, we've seen very very high valuations for some of the solutions that they can get, you know, point to traditional markets and say, don't apply to this market uh, because what we've seen in the activity and the billions of dollars that we've raised in the past few months. Yeah, if we're going to give them a 2 3 x multiply that valuation, you know, it sucks for me, but again, it's, it's more important that, uh, you know, you do taper and you give that handicap what this space may be and what it could be in the next you know, five to ten years. So, yeah, we're feeling that. So the, the, uh, the thing that is happening, at least as uh, venture investors, is that the window, at least for me, it, it, assuming that I'm holding contest uh, comes at my target return on a, on a company, right? And either by ownership or by multiple cash on cash. What that means is that I have a much shorter window in which I can invest in a company, right? Um, because what is happening is as a crowd investor, you probably have two ways in which you can sort of try to diligence on these uh, tokens uh, and, and token projects. One is where the people behind it have actual reputations um, that they want to preserve somehow, right? That they're legit people. So when you look at companies like, I don't know, Boston, right? Like you have PhD in computer science from Princeton and that is legit. It's like a real person that will probably want to continue uh, doing business, right? Or, or a brand, like brand new. Like, they, have, they have a track record. And so a lot of what you're betting is the signaling on, on that. And so either, either you do that and having venture, uh, reputable venture firms as, as backers of these companies, then you can assume that somebody at least did some diligence and so you can at least outsource your diligence. I mean, which is a very flawed logic, by the way, because that. Um, but, but at least that's something that you can follow, right? Um, the other way is you can audit the code. And my sense is that a lot of people just don't do that, right? When you look at Bancor, that one is amazing. It's like, this is some 40 lines of code, <laughs> right? And, and nobody figured it out until much later. It's, it's so let's just assume that people are not doing the homework, right? And so then as, as, a, as a signaling mechanism, having reputable venture firms, you're going to see that most of the firms that raise larger and higher ICOs are just going to be people that who were lucky enough to get venture investors on board before, and they're just going to use that signaling to just blow it up on the other side. Great. I know we're running up against uh, the break and the end of the break, but I think 
that uh, if the organizer are okay, I'll have one or two more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you provide some examples of unsuccessful ICOs and the reason why they failed? And uh, give some tips how to make a cool ICO one you should include in white paper, in any page. And yeah, two questions. I think we're going to see lots of paper notes of ICOs that um, nobody's anticipated. So, some ICOs that um, apparently succeeded may later on be considered to have failed if the founders and the team kind of boiled in legal grounds or the SEC and angry investors and things like that. So, you know, there are many different ways to look at the success of an ICO. It's not necessarily how much money you raised um, in, in the first instance. But you know, the other things to look out for are the timing. You know, timing is a huge effect. And the volatility of the tokens you receive it. So if you look at the original Ethereum ICO people point out fundraiser, um, they raised about two million dollars in Bitcoin and they only really got to spend nine million dollars because you know having Bitcoin just got a foul and foundation kept hoping you know stabilized it up and did. So um, you know, if, you, if you're going to raise more money, you know, you should really have a strategy for hedging that the funds that you write because it's probably from there. You might go up and down, but then you just want to be sure you've got the same Thank you. One more question. Hi, um, given that all these tokens are tied to people and companies which are very easily reached by regulators. In the long run, I'm sure you all see regulatory handbooks start to come down at some point. How do you see this being any more efficient than what we have now as far as no funding? If they're going to be subject to the same regulators, how have you seen these tokens and ICOs really being an improvement? Uh, that's a really easy question. Imagine doing the administrative process for proxy voting for uh, position in Oculus a year ago. I think there's, there's fundamental technical offerings direct to your token specific for what we eventually will see conversion sort of rights and so forth. Um, that's not necessarily going to pop the person raising the funds, uh, but in this sense, from that perspective, the like, length of site, a real time audit function, and being able to know where every positions are or any decisions made in the company, that's yes, highly relevant. Um, I think from a second perspective, you, you can argue that uh, because we've seen a lot of these folks in the market raise an ICO um, and then you get into some prior pressure as well, and sure it's a smaller cycle as it relates to fund raising, typically five to seven years in venture funding for us to see a major or a horrible outcome. Um, we haven't really felt that yet. I think this, this trend is really only started about a year ago, two years ago in proper. It wasn't called that back it was different, but um, I think the other significant value proposition also goes to the rights of the actual shareholder. So if you have an understanding of all of those horizontally within a position as opposed to just looking up uh, a stock or, or otherwise, I mean, there's a lot of information that can be very valuable to at that moment as opposed to looking at that stock to machine of which C level sort of what share is on the Saturday. Okay, so I'm going to take the moderator's feedback for the last question. Um, um, this is uh, to uh, at least. Um, I know you're the founder of Women in Venture. You look around the room and it's very typical of the 85 percent plus male. And we know that uh, the venture capital industry has a problem with diversity and inclusion. And I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are about the potential for, um, for the, uh, and what are the issues around blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies uh, for improving the diversity and inclusion. Um, in, in venture capital in particular. I referenced this earlier in our response and that one of the benefits of token sales, I think, is that founders um, that generally would have a hard time accessing resources now can do so through the crowd um, in a way where perhaps their incentives are better aligned with their investors. And so on the founder side, in addition to seeing that will be used by highly technical founders. We've also seen them be used by women founders or by founders, um, black or Latin founders. So for instance, there's a startup called Patientory that's doing, uh, that's working at the intersection of healthcare records and the blockchain. They raised $7.2 million and um, 
Krista is an African American woman based in Atlanta, so not only is she not in the heart of Silicon Valley or one of the major financing hubs, um, but it, so far as I know, I believe she's in fact the, the African American woman that's raised the most in an early stage round of financing. On the investor side, um, I think that the space um, that, that truly is quite open. I think there's really very few traditional investors that understand the blockchain or cryptocurrency space, including folks that are active or perhaps active without having, um, you know, necessarily a deep understanding of the technology and the, the implications for applications that will be built on top of it. Um, and so I, I, I hope that what we see emerge is that the investors that rise to the top in terms of, of prominence and significance over the course of the next three, four, or five years will include people from the crowd that make smart investments in token sales and will include a more diverse range of traditional VCs. I think that's an excellent spot to end on. I want to thank the panelists and the audience for the great questions. Thank you.